Hi, Gladiators. Good turnaround Tuesday to you. How's everyone doing today? Hello, Patrick. Dan, how you doing, buddy? My trading more, your brother, Ziggy. Everyone, everyone doing okay? I'm not going to try and... Hi, Kevin Hardy. How are you? Mesman, Mrs. Boo. <laughs> how are you? I'd like to start the session off by acknowledging the community on Pound Aussie. I made a trading suggestion short up here, covered here, and I missed the re-entry, but last week during the uh, <clears throat> big stock market sell-off, a lot of people, I know Armand was selling this rally, Viche, a few, uh, at least three people in the community uh, gave me some looks, some screenshots for shorts up here in the 7560 range or so. Congratulations, 280 pips on that one. Nice work face. Hi, Patrick, how you doing? And I'd like to just go over a couple of things that I talked about yesterday that are manifesting before we went off the air and ended the session yesterday. I talked about a tail that we were getting in the pound that was up here. And anytime I make a trading suggestion and you're up 40, 50 pips, you take half. So even if you sold the uh, close of the candle at 15 or 20 at, at one point, about 40, 50 pips. So perhaps we get a correction in EG a little bit, but still looks like there is potential for a top. We have to get through 940. We get through 940, we'll have 860. And then something that took a few days to manifest, but finally beginning to, is uh, Euro Aussie. Okay, talked about it after this big reversal bar. We were never able to take out those highs, so there were a few opportunities. I was talking about 48.50. So I hope that the trading suggestions and cable yesterday and Euro Aussie helped you guys. Hello, William Whitelaw, Zahir, Zia. So those were a few ideas that I had. Of course, the linchpin is the Dixie. We all know how oversold it is, the DSI is at five. We are starting to diverge, starting to get some non-confirmations. Why can't we rally back to 97.80 to 98? And even the Euro, which has led the parade all the way up and had huge momentum, extreme momentum to the upside is starting to show some cracks. Okay, this last high, look at the RSI and the last high was only 59 up here. So uh, very possible even if we're going to higher levels that we get some type of pullback, maybe even under the 111 handle. So I think you could sell rallies, be wrong over this high. This might be the second drive. Maybe they could squeeze out a third, but would not be long euro either. Looking for a dollar bounce. Those are my calls. The next one's yours. See who's in the house with me today. The staff. I know uh, Steve and Stelios. Hey, Hi, Blake. Hey, how's it going? Good, buddy. How are you today? Good, good, good. I know. Uh, I know Steve and Stelios are out traveling, so um, so I wanted to make sure that uh, that I came in and um, you know discuss some things that are happening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, well, you, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That uh, really, I just wanted to review what I talked about yesterday. You know, yesterday, Blake, uh, uh, after the breakout in EG, it kind of confirmed that you know the pound was a preferred short, and we'll see if it works. It's working on a minor basis from yesterday's high, and uh, euro. Some of the euro crosses are starting to work, so. Uh, perhaps we're finally in that zone where we could correct back towards uh, the one ten and a half level. That lo looks uh, possible to me here. Yeah. Well, let me let me go ahead and uh, you know what I like to do, uh, Dale. Yeah. When, I mean, whenever. Well, one of the first things that I do is uh, is as I go through all the majors. I mean, I pull right. up. Um, this this is a bias chart, and I've been it's it still says wise trade on there because I haven't removed it here. I can just actually delete that. Okay, so this is the it's gone now. <laughs> I, I I was too lazy to 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 just delete it. Anyway, 
um, this is like a bias chart. I've always done this uh, as uh, when I, whenever I um, um, hold on one second. It, I, so here's a reason why Blake's a good trader. He's a hard working technician. I mean, Blake puts not just monitoring and trading, but he puts a lot of time into this uh, art. Well, art form. There, Every, every morning, every morning I, I go through and I go through all the charts and I figure out, you know, is it bullish, bearish, range bound, uh, what were the key support and resistance levels? And it really helps me tailor my, my trading day. So, um, and, and I have to do it every single day. It's as boring as it is. Um, you know, I go through every chart. I go through all the majors and I go, okay, well, all right, here's the euro. You know, here's the cable, you know, here's the Aussie, and I go through them all, and I, and I look at them all, and I try to figure out where, you know, where levels of interest are going to be for me, and people go, well, you know, support and resistance, what, what does that mean? Is it horizontal, or is it, you know, uh, you know, what, 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 you know, defines these support and resistance levels, and really, the support and resistance levels are, they could be a combination of things. They could be a fib level. They could be a resistance. They could be a, a horizontal resistance or support. They, they could be, be a, a trend average. line, moving yeah. averages. Yeah, they and, and 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 hopefully a confluence of things. You know, yeah. um, and 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 so I go through each and every um, major, and that's what I used to do with the morning edge, and that's why I think the morning edge was so popular, is that I would take every chart. And I would say, hey, okay, here's the euro dollar, Dale. We're looking at it, and uh, yeah, relative strength is a little divergent here. You can see how, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, divergent on the relative strength uh, as we're approaching, you know, the spike high from the election night. So I would expect that any move up towards 113.07 is probably going to be a rejection. So then I just, you know, I take that number. And I, you know, put it on the uh, put it on the, the the bias chart as you know. In this case, would be resistance, uh, you know, and 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 support would be all the way back down here at uh, well. One what's the what's the asterisk mean uh, you have on that? Uh, they're important. Or is it they're important. Yeah, okay. they're really important. Okay. So because I know that the one thirteen ten level is going to be really important. Why? Because you know that was the yeah you know, the spike high from the election night, and. Um, so what I do is I go through every one, and then it helps shape my decision making for the day. You know, if I can if I can sit here and go, okay, well the euro is bullish, and the pound dollar is more or less range bound. Well, then I'm still going to be more bullish the euro pound because the euro is you know more bullish than the pound. If, if that makes any sense to you, it helps me um, make decisions based on the dollar pairs, which I predominantly focus on at this time of the day. But then it helps me also. Uh, you know, make decisions based on what crosses I'm looking at. So, mm -hmm. so when when I look, like you know, and I, I'm just going to go over to like the, uh, the the majors here. I mean, I look at the euro dollar. We are divergent, and and can we push higher? I mean, the dollar index, yes. The DSI is you know very weak, and and uh, and and is it in you know could it bounce at any time? Absolutely, it could. Uh, but is it? It is is the uh, is is it does it mean that the dollar can't go any higher? And a matter of fact, or any lower. A matter of fact, the DSI improved by one point yesterday, um, uh, but it's still very extremely low levels, and and so I would expect that the dollar might get a lift and it might get a little bit of a bounce back, but it, but you know how much of a pullback are we going to get in the euro dollar? I mean, you know. And, and I wrote down like 111.70 because 111.70 was this, it was a 618, okay, on the way up. So that was significant. You can see as we rejected there. Then right. we broke it and retested it. So that means, and this is a four-hour chart, on the way back down, this, the, if you're just looking for like a, you know, like a place just to, even if it's playing the euro long for maybe 20 or 30 pips, you know, your better bet would maybe be picking it up down here at 111.70 and and being a buyer down there. Now, a lot of you might say, well, why don't I just short the, the euro dollar? I mean, you can, but as you can see, the momentum is very strong to the upside. So if you're, you know, deciding that you wanted to fade the, uh, the euro dollar, I mean, you got to keep in mind that you're going counter trend, if you will, right? 
I mean, yes. and, and so that that's the, you know whenever you're yeah, going, I don't think you know, I, I don't think I recommended a short. I, I think I uh, talked about that we could. Oh and no, I'm no. Glad you, I'm glad you brought back that uh, brought up that 1170 area because the high was what about 1280, and then yeah. if we so if we penetrate that 618, just arithmetically would take it back down to under 111 like towards 10 and a half or so yeah yeah it, yes it, it it really could but again you, you know that's why i'd buy I, it i'm always uh, i'm always faced with the same questions from traders you know when i look at something and i go well i wouldn't buy it here so the next question is would you short it and it's like just because i feel that the euro dollar could come down doesn't mean that i'm willing to short it great because point yeah, because because you know I used to do that, and I'm sure many have, Blake. You know, you go well. You know, I I want to be a buyer at 1170. So if I think it's going to go there, why not uh, shoot for 60 pips on the downside? But that's yeah. a different trade. That's a it, completely different trade. It's a different trade. You're going counter trend. You're you, yeah. you know you know, and and I'm looking at not just the charts. I mean, the charts are important to me. Yes, but I'm also thinking about correlations. I mean, I look at, I look at, uh, I look at gold right now and silver. I mean, they look pretty firm. And if yeah. gold and silver are strong, you know, it's really tough for the dollar to get much momentum when gold and silver are moving higher. So it's like, okay, well, can it come down? Sh sure. Am I? Ooh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. As as you know, it's early in the morning for us. Um, Am I am I willing to go you know you know trade the dollar on the long side? Eh, maybe not you know, and so I might just look for a better place to just to be a buyer and try to go in the direction of the trend, and and so that's how I tackle the market. And I'm and I and I always am the first to admit to people, I am not good at flip flopping directions. Like some people are really truly masters of that. You know, they can they, they go long and then they turn around and go short and then they turn back around and go long again. I'm really not that good, and I I'm 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 willing to admit that. I if I find a direction or a trend that I want to trade, I'm typically going to trade in that direction. And any type of pullback I'll use to be a you know to go back in the direction of the trend. I tend not to counter trend or counter my at least my bias or what my my direction is unless it like like I'm a if I'm if, like let's say I was looking at the euro dollar like I'll give you a good example um, uh, I'm looking at the euro dollar and I do want to sell it do you know where I want to sell it Dale take a guess yeah, if I'm gonna sell the euro dollar 113 one thir one 11 no I I want to I, I want to sell it at 114 now the reason why I want to sell it at 114 is because it's channel resistance. I see. Okay. You know, and I and I think this is actually more. I don't know why this is a. I have to draw yeah, that looks good. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, this is this is channel resistance, and I feel that right. if we do get up to 114, it is going to be a short up there, and I'd be willing to take a uh, 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 a trade up there. I know it's a 786 retracement. It's going to be channel resistance of a channel that we've been following for the last couple of years. I'd be willing to take a counter trend short there. But right now, nah, you know, it's, I don't, no, I don't, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be a buyer. I'd rather, you know, find some dips to buy it. I, you know, I, I think the Euro looks strong on a lot of different crosses and I think, I think gold looks strong. Silver looks strong. Um, Hell, even the bond market looks pretty strong. You know, you take bonds, and you know, if yields continue to come down, uh, the, the the bond market looks like it could continue to you know can continue to rally, which is going to be, you know, bearish the dollar as yields come down. So, again, um, am I willing to short the euro? No, probably not. It doesn't mean that it won't go down either. I'm just saying it's not yeah. the, the right trade for me. How and, about the pound? And, and, How about the pound? That's your next move. Yeah, the the pound. You know, I, I actually did short a little bit of pound at eighty. I, I was short yesterday. Um, I shorted yesterday at like thirty something, somewhere up here. Okay. Yeah, and that's fine. And I was a little, yeah. little, yeah, a little triple top spike. You know, traded it last night. Now, uh, and let me let me say this. You know, from all of us here uh, at Forex Analytics, you know, our thoughts and prayers go out to the 
to the people of the the, the Ari, Ariana and Grande, you know, concert. The terrorist attack last night was horrible. I, I just saw a picture of a little girl that was obviously one of the victims, and it just it kills me as a parent. It it, it yeah. kills me. But um, I didn't know what had happened at the time, and so when the pound spiked down to uh, to to like one twenty nine eighty. Um, 80, 82 or 80. You anyway, I booked it, not realizing what had happened. And then I saw the headlines and I'm like, oh, God, you know, but I, I, I mean, I wanted to be short the cable anyway. But I look at the cable and um, something that if, if you're a Forex Analytics subscriber or even if you listen to the the week ahead video that I did on, um, on um, um, or over the weekend, yeah, the, this this pound, you know, you can see it in green here, has been following like this little up channel. So I, I've been a little skeptical about the pound going much higher than it is. The, the, the Brexit proceedings and negotiations over the next couple of years should be pretty difficult for the UK. You know, you're, you're, uh, you've got, I mean, the rest of Europe, you know, it's kind of like, kind of like, Oh, you know, we're getting a divorce, and 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 the UK is like, well, I want half, and and this is gonna not going to be an easy divorce proceedings, you know. And the EU is like, no, you can't have half. <laughs> we gener we generate most of the revenues. You're going to take this, and you know, and it's going to be like, no, it's a common property, you know. No, you no, know, I get half. No, and it's going to be a really diff difficult negotiations for the UK moving forward, I think, and so. Uh, I'm a little skeptical about the pound going much higher than where we're currently at. I mean, we might get up to the 132 level. Um, I think this 131 is a 38% retracement following the Brexit decision. I think the pound's going to struggle while it's up here. So I don't mind being on the short side of the cable here. But what I am really looking for is, is a break looking... to buy, a break to buy around 27 or. Well, yeah, you know, I think that, that the, the pound might, might come back down to like 127, you know, to the breakout yeah. point. But what I'm really watching right now, intraday, is I'm watching this 129 level, this, this little trend line support. Because yeah. if this level breaks, then it opens up more downside for the cable. And that's important to me because I am long the euro pound. Now, um, and, and this, I'm, I'm kind of... Devi uh, deviating away from like some of these other majors here, but the euro pound I've got a long on, and my cost average is you know in the twenties, which it, it it needs to pull back a little bit. I mean the relative strength yeah. is divergent; it's probably going to pull back to like eighty six thirty, maybe eighty six twenty. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that the euro pound pulls back a little bit further. The economic data, generally speaking, out of Europe was pretty good. I mean you know overnight the the, the PMIs, uh, uh, the, the services PMI out of uh, France was good. The German PMIs were good. German IFO was stronger. Um, the Eurozone flash manufacturing PMIs were, were, were stronger than expected. So whatever setback that we see in the euro dollar or, in, excuse me, in the euro pound is probably going to be fairly short-lived as the, uh, you know, UK public sector net borrowing was a little weaker the CBI realized sales were a little weaker. So I, I don't expect, um, you know, much of a pullback here. I mean, we get a pullback in the euro pound. We might pull back another 15 or 20 pips. But you got to think about that as being an opportunity to be on the long side. Because remember, and don't forget, the euro pound, excuse me, the euro pound daily chart is in breakout territory. That's breakout territory. I mean, yes, we've had a nice run. But even the inverted head and shoulder pattern here points to like 87.50. So... Uh, any type of little setback in the euro pound, you got to use it as an opportunity to be a buyer. You know what a common misconception is, Blake, on euro pound people, and I used to think this too, that uh, the dollar could rally and that could put pressure on both the euro and the pound. But even with them going down, the euro would go down less than the pound. So oh, yeah, the euro pound from higher, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so directionally, you could have a dollar bounce and euro pound continue to be constructive. And a lot of people think if you're going to have a dollar bounce, you're going to have uh, a big pullback in euro pound. But uh, I've, I've been on the, on the other side of that 
where I expected that to happen. And even though the dollar was rebounding, euro pound remained firm. Or it yeah, passed. it's because that, that, that would just mean that the pound's falling faster than the euro. Right. Cause exactly. it has, yeah, because it, it's more of the it's more of the relationship between the euro and the pound. It has nothing to right. do with the dollar. So exactly. that, that is a that's a common misconception for new, especially new FX traders. You you are correct. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, the same thing happens with the Aussie New Zealand. You know, I might be long the Aussie New Zealand, and everybody's like, but both the Aussie and the New Zealand are falling. So how does the Aussie New Zealand go up? It's like, well, if the New Zealand dollar is falling faster than the Aussie dollar, then the right. Aussie New Zealand is going to go higher. It doesn't matter what the, the, the it's doing against the dollar. So that's why when I, yeah, that's why when, uh, excuse me, yeah. I actually slept pretty good last night. You know, you know, I almost, I could say I borderline almost overslept. So um, yeah, you recovered from that bad shirt party earlier I, than I thought. Yeah, I am. You're I, young, I, I, strong, buddy. Yeah. Hey uh, guys. Oh, here we are. Mr. Cyprus is here. Oh, we've got uh, we got Steve and Stelios that are chiming in from hey. Cyprus. We we are currently actually driving in the highway in Cyprus. Oh, let's let's see it. Let's see you no, guys we're drive. We're not doing anything illegal. Stelios is holding the phone. Uh, what, <laughs> where's just, uh, what side is the steering just, wheel on? We just popped to say hi, and tomorrow we're gonna connect live from the IFX Expo to you know to show you the the place the place around it. It's really beautiful and it's really big, and it's gonna be a very nice event. So we're we're definitely gonna connect at some point uh, during the webinar. So we just want to say hi to everybody and. You know, we, we, we are listening to the webinar uh, while driving. Okay. Glad you had a safe flight, guys. Have fun. And uh, let the world know about Forex Analytics while you're there. And I'll follow we up. Will. Okay, bye. You, you guys have a Bye. safe trip. Thanks. We, we, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye. Right, bye, guys. The Traveling bye. Traders, Stephen Stelios. Right, right, exactly. You know, it's um, I, I think it's great. I, I've been to a lot of um, you know, money shows over the years, um, uh, and and I and I, I think it's going to be a great experience for these two guys to go and and go there themselves and see what it's all about. Yeah, when I saw that uh, in Cyprus, I thought of those guys. I said, someone needs to go. Yeah, it's based on your they right. Got, they they jumped right on it, buddy. Oh yeah, because they're like they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, can I get a couple of days away from my 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 wife? <laughs> you got it. Yeah. So um, so anyway, uh, just kind of continuing on with like our our major analysis. You know, one thing that's been very surprising is the kiwi. Have you seen how strong this kiwi is? Now, I don't know if it should be super surprising because of, and I'm going to draw this out for you guys. Those if false breakouts, man. Is, yeah, it was a false breakdown. Right yeah. there, and right that down. false breakdown is like really squeeze squeeze the kiwi. Now, do I think that the kiwi is really bullish from here? No, I think it is a squeeze, and I think risk appetite is helping it along. Um, but it, it is wreaking havoc on a lot of these pairs. I mean, I, and I don't, I'm not in the Euro New Zealand or the Pound New Zealand, but you can see the Euro New Zealand is coming off pretty sharply. Pound New yeah. Zealand is obviously coming down. Remember, we we were talking about um, the Pound New Zealand. This would be a place where ultimately want to be long. I mean, right. the, the pound New Zealand, uh, and we were talking about this last week. I mean, we're coming down to some probably some decent support. I don't know if I'd want to get long just yet. I might actually wait a little bit further because I think the pound's, you know, feeling some heat right now. I might look for a move like this in the pound New Zealand. All the you know, way to the breakout as possible. Yeah, yeah, maybe down to 180, 180, 50. I mean, you're talking about another 400 pips, and so that's that's something that I think is uh, is is entirely doable with the uh, with the pound New Zealand. Um, so, you know, just uh, just a little heads up. So, I mean, looking at the Kiwi, like I said, it's strong and it's really been outperforming. You can see how 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 strong of a rally is. We're we're approaching the 161 percent extension and some um, some horizontal resistance here. So right up around uh, 70, 50, 70, 60 should should offer some good resistance. And you can see like on the bias chart today, I wrote down 70, 60. I think that's going to be key. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we knock our head up here, break this resistance just slightly, 
you know, trip a few stops, and then, you know, then the, the upside in the Kiwi dollar, um, you know, this upside momentum that we've been seeing might, might slow down a bit, uh, because it has been extremely, extremely strong. Um, the Aussie dollar um, also, you know, broke a downtrend line, 200-day moving average is up and coming, it's not too far away. Um, Oh, you know, there's a moment of silence on the uh, New York Stock Exchange floor. I think we should uh, abide by that. All right, so well, we took a moment of silence for the uh, victims of uh, in the in Manchester. Um, just really, really, very, very sad event. Uh, anyway, going back to the Aussie dollar um, rally to the 200-day moving average seems ex uh, possible. Dollar Canadian. I mean, this 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 in in my opinion, um, Dale has been one of the biggest fake out breakouts. And um, if you're wondering why the Canadian is so strong, uh, it is a massive false breakout. Right here on the weekly chart, we hit the 50% retracement, um, or actually the 618, excuse me. Right. Massive false breakout. But on top of that, and I think the, the, the biggest fear right now is that we had a, um, you know, we have major, um, uh, 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 like a, like a positioning problem with the Canadian currency. You know, the, the market has been historically and aggressively short the Canadian currency. So now the, the Canadian currency is strengthening because of this false breakout. So you guys got to keep that in mind as the Canadian, you know, continues to fall. You know, there's, there's, uh, there, you know, there's traders that are like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to buy the dollar Canadian because I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, it, you know, it, it, it's not going to go much further down. Well, just remember the positioning is so, it was so aggressively short Canadian currency that this is not surprising. And what kills me even worse, Dale, is that I'm not short the, the dollar Canadian right now. That, that's the one thing that like kills me. It's like I look at it and go, Hi, I knew this was going to happen, yet I didn't pull the trigger. And just because I never found the right entry, you know, ever since Friday. Friday we closed at the 50% retracement right here, but we've been kind of sliding ever since and I haven't seen a big enough bounce for me to sell into but it is uh, it is and does continue to look well, there's pretty still plenty of people to wash out is your point because of the extreme positioning yeah yeah there 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 really still could be um, you know like I I look oh here's a, this is a big one Talk this about is, extreme positioning and I'm gonna bring it up with our guests because uh, he analyzes rates in the treasuries. I saw yesterday, Blake, that we went from uh, the specs and bonds, went from a record short position to now having a record long position in the shortest amount of time. And you know when you look at COT stuff, yeah. um, you know, usually it it's a zigzag line for it to get from, you know, short to long. It's a, It was a straight line move to now the largest net long position in bonds. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it surprised me. Not, not just short covering net long specs record from wow. from a record net short to a record net long in less than thirty days. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it. I don't know what to make of it. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of crazy. Yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah. Well. Here's okay. So the U.S. dollar Swedish krona. I'm, I'm going to bring this one up because um, I, I know so many people that are trying to buy the dollar right now. Okay, like I, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I hear about it, and I'm, I'm, I hear everybody's like, oh, you know, I want to buy the dollar. I'm going to buy this dip, and you know, the U.S. dollar Swedish krona is one of those currency pairs that tends to be a leader 
uh, it per, per, it's a leader for me for like dollar dollar trades. Okay, and and what I, what I mean by that is, I tend to look at the U.S. dollar Swedish krona for help with direction. So if I'm, you know, for example, if I'm long the dollar and I and I'm looking at the dollar index and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to start buying dollars here. I'll, I'd like to confirm something with the U.S. dollar Swedish krona typically. Okay. Right now, the U.S. dollar Swedish krona today, and, and I'm, I'm using today just because it is like today, it's breaking a trend line, and we are at the 50% retracement of the, uh, the the 2016 lows to the highs of 2017. We're at the 50% retracement right now. Okay, what that tells me is if we break into new lows, and it's also horizontal. You can see horizontal support here. If we break into new lows from here. The idea that the dollar can rally much further than where we're at diminishes for me. So in other words, if I'm, if I'm thinking about buying the dollar and this, this US dollar Swedish krona continues to break down, I will second guess that decision almost each and every time. So I, I want you guys to think about that because the dollar Canadian or the dollar Swedish krona really looks pretty horrible. Vulnerable. It, it does. It looks extremely vulnerable, and and I mean this is a if you look on a weekly basis, I mean and and I know um, uh, Steve and I talked about this yesterday. I mean look at look at this weekly chart. This is going back to two thousand nine, right? Look at this. False breakout, break this trend line. I mean, we may come down to like you know back towards the eight to eight twenty level, and if that happens in the U.S. dollar Swedish krona, the dollar is going to get wrecked. I mean, the dollar is really going to see some downside pressure, in my opinion. You know that that to me starts telling me that the euro dollar might actually head up into the high teens, maybe one seventeen, maybe one eighteen. Yeah, um, that would line up. I think we're going to retest the 92 low in Dixie. Yeah, and 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 it's entirely possible. And and that you know, and and that that's the kind of stuff. This is the kind of stuff that really that I'm looking at that lead me to believe that the dollar may not be done here. That the dollar may have some more downside and 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 I know the the DSI is you know stretched I understand that but at the same time we're in we're, we live in kind of crazy times we have a we have a very vulnerable uh, and um, jumpy uh, 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 you know um, Leadership here in the U.S. Domestic, political, yeah, a lot of political risks. situation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we have situations where, you know, the market could get, you know, the market may not, may lose its confidence in the dollar, and that that could be a long period of time of dollar weakness. So I don't, I don't view the dollar as buying on dips. I view the dollar as selling rallies. And right. so right now... Um, you know, as everybody continues to look at the dollar and say, "Oh, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to buy it." I don't know. I'm, I'm on the, I'm, I'm kind of on the other side of that, that camp right now. And the U.S. dollar Swedish krona is really leading me to believe that. And and if you look at, you know, the, this pair, I mean, we have a lot of downside left if things start to. And, and one thing about the the uh, the the Swedish krona is you you think about the Rix Bank. How about if they, you know, they, they they pull out of the negative uh, rates and they start to normalize policy a bit. I mean, we could be trading down, you know, down towards eight really, really yeah. quick. So yeah. those are the those are the things that I'm thinking about. It's not just the charts; it's also about you know the the, the bigger, grander scheme of things as well. Okay. So just well, some, great just presentation. I'm, just before before you go, you have a view on Euro Aussie. Uh, no, well, let's take a look at it. Um, because I, I noticed while the euro continued to make new highs, uh, Euro Aussie uh, was not doing so. You're yeah, on the weekly chart here. Okay. This is the day. Th yeah, this is the weekly. Weekly. So let's go over to the okay. daily. You know, um, the Euro Aussie. It's one of those that that 
I've in the past I've traded a lot with uh, risk appetite and risk aversion. So that means that you know if if the market goes risk off, um, that means everybody's trying to just sell equities. We could right. continue to rally in the Euro Aussie because the, that means the Aussie and the Kiwi tend to underperform at that point. Um, okay. Uh, we are such elevated levels in equities right now that I I think it's possible that we see you know some continued selling pressure in equities, and if that's the case, will you know or you know some selling pressure from here? If that's the case, will the Euro Aussie respond bullishly? So. I don't know. It, it's it's because it, I don't know. We haven't seen risk off in so long. Like, what does it look like? Do you know what it looks like? Because I haven't seen. I can't. I can't remember a, the, a time where we saw, you know, stocks have a ten, fifteen percent correction. It's hard to know what the correlations will be in the event that that happens. You know. Um, yeah. It's so been, it's been a. I, I think at least four years. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. So uh, I, I'm I'm kind of undecided. That that's like I have to look at some of these, like the Euro Aussie, Euro Canadian, um, and and kind of think, okay, well, where technically, you know, do I want to be a buyer or a seller? And so it, with with that being said, and what I was talking about, like risk aversion, if 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 I think that stocks are come are going to come down. And then that means the Euro Aussie might actually outperform to the upside. I might be more apt to be a buyer of the Euro Aussie. But looking at it, like looking at the chart right now, yeah. I mean, we're at the 50% retracement. I mean, do I, yeah. do, I, do I really want to be a buyer here? Probably not. You know, do I want to be a buyer on a pullback? Sure, that might be a good idea if we, if we yeah. pull back. But where are we going to pull back to? I don't, I don't know. And, you know. Or you 40, uh, 48, 50, if it gets through there, I think 46 to 44 is possible. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is, um, again, but, well, you know, we're, I, I, it's hard to make those decisions at this point. Yeah, without... You know, I was thinking, you, you bring up, uh, you know, all the uncertainty about what's happening with our president. And, you know, this recovery that we had after the announcement of the special prosecutor, I don't know, what did we retrace, 88% of that yes, decline 80, already? 80. Yeah, we, we know, it kind of makes me think that, you know, nothing really happened in May. I know May's not over, but uh, it kind of sets up for a rally into when Comey testifies. I know some psycho guys that are looking for things in June. And you even mentioned it, that uh, selling May – and go away didn't seem to be working. What these? I'm quoting you. What if this stretches out into June? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, I think June eighth, Comey comes to the hill, and I, I think that could be an inflection point in the market. Some point. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be out of town on uh I'm gonna be out of town the um the let's see I'll be out of town uh, the 29th through 31st uh, at my sister's wedding. So people yeah. that listen to my old daily webinar the morning edge know that when i leave everything something volatile, big happens something big happens volatility spikes aggressively so everyone says everyone says that everybody knows it it's 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 crazy dale i mean I, no but i mean i know i have other friends that say <laughs> say it too but every time i go away something big happens well, it's no, it's it's weird because it's like documented, uh, huh? it's documented right. on for fifteen years of webinars. People, people, right. pay, they would pay me to take a vacation. Now they didn't really pay me, but people would beg me to take a vacation because they knew as soon as I went, I was gone. The market yeah. would go crazy. It and it happens like without fail. So um, yeah, uh, beginning of June, um, you know, June eighth, possibly end of this month, possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are still in that 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 uh, sweet spot for for equities to to come under pressure. You know, sometime here within yeah. the next you know couple of weeks. So um, yeah, it's doable. It's it's definitely doable. So anyway, those are you know there's a few things that I'm watching. You know, and I also looked at the VIX. The VIX. You know, we just filled the gap here. You know, yeah. just as you know, we rallied. You know, you you pointed out we rallied uh, since the we announced the special prosecutor and the right. stock market rally. Well, you know, the VIX actually filled the gap too. I know um, so much for the island. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's just it, you know, uh, the 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 market's pretty good at squashing volatility because that they know that if you squash volatility, it keeps equity markets fairly well um, bid. And that's not only that, there's record net short positions in VIX, so they were able to turn it back from 16 again. Uh, if it knocks on the door again next time, I think we get through it, but. Uh, huge net short positions in VIX instruments. So well, that's where the money is made. The money, yeah. the money is made being short volatility. I mean, that's yeah. all the that's all the big money has been doing. You know, just yeah. selling volatility, and and it's working. That's the that's the thing about it. It's been working. You know, uh, very well. But um, I would say though, uh, that's going to be a key, Blake. If we knock on the door of sixteen on the VIX again. Uh, I think the third time you knock on the door, you have a better chance of getting through it. So if that ever happens, I think then you have a pretty clear sell signal in the market because that would measure 22 in the VIX, which we haven't been since last fall. And Steve had a trend line that would break out from a long-term downtrend. And, and uh, so you really have your line in the sand in the VIX now. Look at that. Yeah. Right. Over 16 uh, you know, lighten up on stocks. That's all I would say. Yeah, it probably makes that probably makes a lot of makes a lot of sense. Um, really, it really does. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that that really is jumping out at me right now. I mean, you you look at the dollar yen. The dollar yen is just kind of floundering around. I'm surprised that the dollar yen hasn't hasn't seen any type of rally, which you know suggests to me that we we probably are going to see um, we're going to probably see a continuation move lower. In the dollar yeah. yen, at some point, that looks you know like like this. I like um, that channel. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, you have I mean, them both converging down there. Uh, your downtrend, your uptrend line, and the downtrend line should converge a little under 106. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, probably you, you know somewhere down here. If 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 yeah. it happens, I'm not yeah. saying it's going to. I'm just saying that 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 you know. I look at the dollar yen and it can't muster a rally, even as stocks rally. I mean, you take the stock market and it, and and it's just a massive divergence. I mean, here's yeah, what a recover in stocks and the yen didn't recover at all. Right. I mean, look look at the dollar yen here. You yeah. know, we had this opposite. Yeah, we we just have this massive divergence. So if 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 stocks come under pressure, I mean, the dollar yen's probably going to break lower. I would, that would be my yeah. that would be my assumption. Um, uh, you, you know, so yeah, that that's pretty that's pretty much it. Anyway, um, um, Dale, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna let you take back over. I know uh, you have a okay. you have a guest coming in. You probably have some other things that yeah. you want to talk about, but uh, I just want to stop in and say hello to everybody, and um, and and you know, really, uh, I really wanted to express my 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 deepest sympathies for those that may have been affected by the uh, by the the, the, the terrorist act uh, overnight it was a very very sad event and especially when there's I mean it's always sad but man when there's it's uh, kids involved it just really hits home um, for me so yeah, well, life anyway is so fragile isn't it, it it's so it fragile. really is and, it and really Blake, is. Uh, th thanks for coming on you you sound back to speed that bachelor party great recovery time my friend Thanks, uh, and and I'll be I'll be here tomorrow too. Uh, I'll 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 be in here tomorrow because I know Steve and Steve and Stelios are are traveling. Even though they're going to chime in, uh, you know I'll be here to show any charts that uh, that that pop up that uh, really I think are are fairly important. Okay, thank thank you so much, Blake. Uh, Blake's Thanks, update, uh, you know, a lot of pearls from Blake here in the last half hour. You know about uh, looking for places to buy the euro rather than sell it. I still think that we're going to get this shot down for Blake to be able to buy it. I think he was talking 11 and a half. You see that the market is struggling up here, Euro USD, and, and now the pound is showing a little bit more relative strength than Euro, and that's what something else Blake talked about, that we could have uh, correction in EG, that there's divergence in EG. And I don't know, since I've been here, since we started FACE, uh, you know, we've been bearish uh, Canada. I've been bearish Canada talking four and a half. Uh, Blake makes uh, the case for it going a lot lower than that, but this is not just a correction. 
and even on FA, you know, the long-term stuff that we have on FA, I'll just pull it up here, really has sharply lower targets if this is a major failure in Canada, which uh, could imply uh, sharply higher crude oil mark, a crude oil market, which is something else that uh, Greg appointed to after a little correction. So there's uh, there's potentially you're not late in Canada. You want to finesse it, but uh, if I go to some of the long term stuff here in Canada, you'll see why this could turn out to be. Here's your weekly. This is something that Blake showed. Okay, so. This is when we failed, okay? We failed from this uh, 61.8 level. And when I go to some of the individual studies like Elliott Wave, it's a little shorter term by Grega. So Grega thought we could trade 34-ish right here. So we're getting there. Then, then we should be looking for rallies. I know there are Canada bulls. But if we're going to get the kind of crude levels that uh, perhaps uh, Kirk talked about yesterday, $75 by year end, he's very bullish of crude. Um, you have to stay on the short side. Too many people long, as, Bra as Blake said, record short positions in Canada, which means, you know, a lot of people are long USD CAD. So something else to keep in mind on the Canadian. I love FA. You guys love FA, and you know what I do is I usually have an idea because I'm kind of an independent thinker, and then I look for support and evidence on my, my view with different views from. Uh, I may take a look at an Elliott view. I probably don't look at basic technical as much because that's what I do. So you know uh, I'm not an Elliottitian. I'm not an expert on harmonics. So I don't look at the basic technical, but this is what Blake showed, you know, breakout, fake out, negated under this five and a half level. So that's how I use FA. Hey, Dale. How are you? Gregor here. Oh, Gregor. Hi. How's it going, buddy? It's okay. Watching charts is always at this hour, you know, interesting. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for, thanks for dropping by. I'm going to give you the screen. Uh, you have about you have about ten minutes if you want to show some things before my interview. Yeah, sure. Uh, we will take a look on this crude oil and dollar. Okay. Oh, All right. So I was just saying that you know I, I have my own independent views, and then I go to experts and Elliot, like you, Grega, or uh, I go to Nick's Harmonics uh, to support my view or give me pause on my view. So um, I'm always glad to see and hear what you think. You got it, buddy. Okay, so you can see cards. Okay, so um, actually, what I really like about Dollar Cat is that this very complex recovery uh, recovery that is underway from uh, for the last twelve months actually it turned down from this equality level. So actually, yeah. the ABC structure. This is still a simple correction that is part of a larger complex correction. Okay, so we had first ABC, then we had the wave X, and now we had the second ABC. And in ABC structures, you will typically see that wave C will be similar in distance compared to wave A. So I was looking at this level around 100%, actually this was 1.380 around there, which it was, was also 61.8 back from the drop, Greg. Uh, this move now, uh, just a second. Right there, right there. Got that high, yeah. 61.8. And, and also we had Not this. Quite. Okay. And also we had this upper parallel trend line. If I highlighted it a little bit, okay. So everything came out in play very well around these levels. Also, there was a, a consolidation of a second wave too. So normally you will wait on correction of a higher degree once once it's underway. That will complete the sequence either at wave 4, but if wave 4 swing highs or swing lows are broken, okay, swing highs in our case, then you may look for a new resistance, potentially reversal at the second correction of a previous 5 wave decline, which was wave 2. So actually everything came out very well here 
and we are turning down very nicely for now. Also, what I want to highlight is that uh, last week, at the start of last week, and also three weeks back, if you recall, we also had a discussion with Steve. We said that minimum three waves to the downside should unfold because of this wedge pattern that completed a sequence in, in wave five of a larger five wave rally. So actually, we were looking for third lack of decline at least towards this trend line support. Okay, but what is really interesting that this third lag uh, leg of decline is now getting extended. It also took um, prices out of this. Uh, channel, which means that prices are accelerating. So uh, bearish momentum is increasing and this is exactly what you want to see in a wave free of an impulsive sell-off, okay, not in wave C. So based on current personality, I would not be surprised if this current weakness will just resume much lower into a black wave free. Okay, so I definitely would remain bearish here on dollar cat, um, definitely for five waves of decline from this uh, let's say from 1.3765. So I personally, what I'm, what I will be watching uh, is a retest of this 1.310 level, okay, and then mm -hmm. watch out for a wave four bounce. And this wave four bounce will be on my radar screen to get on the short side, okay. So this is what I'm watching, uh, especially back around 35. Uh, yes, maybe around there, but but firstly, I need to see. Uh, bottom for wave three to make a little better um, to to define uh, levels for wave four much better. So when we have all needed substructures, sub waves in place, then you can de define your put put your fib levels for wave four compared to wave three and so on. So but yes, if we see 1.34 for completed wave three and then a bounce, then yes, 1.35 would be a nice round level where uh, I would pay attention to it. Also, so on your macro, on your macro stuff, Greg, uh, uh, I, I think I saw it here. Does this put, you know, uh, 130, 125, one, you know, a sub 130 USD CAD back on the table? That this was just a. There you go. There's your beer two. All right. Yeah. So can you look for a quality for beer two? Have a quality to A or one. Uh, actually, what I would be looking at based on this picture for the short term view is we still need to keep in mind that we are trapped in this um, yeah. upward yeah. channel. Okay, so technically speaking, we cannot confirm that the downtrend is already here for a larger drop. Until so, we take out 32? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, firstly, we need to see a decisive break below this uh, trend line support to confirm this larger bearish sell-off. But as it comes to a short-term traders, some more short-term orient oriented traders, trader within the context of a larger wave count. So because larger picture is telling me that yes, we could see more weakness, but short-term trades, my short-term trades would focus for a drop, minimum drop towards the lower side of this channel. So maybe we retested it and who knows what will happen here. Maybe we get another bounce or a, a sell-off. So, but as things stands right now on an hourly chart, four-hour chart, and this daily chart, I think that definitely we may see a retest one of 1.3250. This is the trend line. Also, we have a crude oil, as you pointed out very well. We have a crude oil in very nice bullish uh, bullish form here. Um, we have clearly five waves up. Um, we still don't see any top of a place here for red wave A or red wave 1. We don't know which wave it is, but definitely I will pay attention to more gains after we get any free wave of correction, because I think that any move to the downside, any reversal will be just a temporary post with a new current ongoing uptrend. Okay. So also what I wanted to show you, so this is crude oil and dollar cat. I don't know if traders are watching, but we have um, some very clean structure on a, a shorter term chart here on DAX, okay? If you recall, Dale, uh, I said that uh, stocks could came under pressure, but what is really interesting that S&P 500 made quite surprised, uh, quite surprised me and made a nice retracement, but what yeah. I see, DAX is not following the move, 
Okay, yeah. so German DAX is much, much lower compared to the S&P and this tells me that S&P could still see limited gains. Okay, I don't believe that we'll see any significant breakout higher. I still think that the upside is limited and that there's greater so maybe, potential for maybe a this is the, Maybe this is correcting the stampede into European equities over U.S. equities over the last month or so. And uh, I'd like to ask you this, uh, Greg, I don't know if you have a view on it. Is a weak dollar more positive for foreign equities than U.S. equities? And is a weak dollar, if we really have a major breakdown, that's uh, cyclical or secular in the dollar to the downside. Uh, How do you see that playing out in U.S. dollar-denominated assets? Actually, uh, U.S. dollar had a pretty good correlation with stock markets, with the U.S. stock market. So I'm still not sure if we should ignore that. Uh, I, th I, I just think that there is still not confirmed that dollar has stopped out uh, which means that if the dollar index will continue higher, I think also that stocks could remain bullish as well on the longer term. So I would not ignore this uh, type of a correlation. Okay. Uh, it's been acting pretty good with a weak dollar too. It seems like it doesn't matter. They could spin it either way. Yes. Uh, actually, the co correlation on this um, are very similar from from period to period. So. It's really hard to stick with one view. You, you really have to be nimble and pay more uh, close attention to intraday charts where maybe correlations can differ compared to the longer term views. Okay. But on the longer term scale, as you know, stocks are in uptrend, dollar index is in uptrend. And for me, that's a bottom line. Okay. Where would you say the dollar, in, uh, dollar index would negate the uh, long term uptrend it's been in? Uh, what price that, level? Back under 92, would that do it? Uh, just a second. So here, actually, I put discounts together uh, uh, this week. Uh, actually, what I'm, I'm tracking, two different counts here. Uh, let me show another one. And so on your monthly, you're looking for a low pretty pretty soon here. That uh, we've almost completed four with a five mean, to come. Yes. I'm tracking two different counts. Here on the left, as you can see, I'm tracking potential ending diagonal if we consider that this contracting formation was a triangle in wave B. Okay? So uh -huh. actually, as long uh, this extended line, as you can see, uh, yeah. we are yeah. around this trend line, this week close, uh, this monthly close price will be very important. Currently, we are just beneath right this there. Trend. Yes. Yeah. So it depends how uh, this. So if we close under it, we'll head towards your uh, look on the right. We're yes, away from it. Exactly. And I was talking to retests of 92 ish. You're in the same ballpark. Yes, exactly. If we break down. Yes. If we get, if prices on dollar index and on euro dollar to the bullish side will remain as they are, if we will not see any significant reversal by the end of the month then definitely I think that we should look, be looking for this flat correction here on the right, um, which let me just level the substructures here. This is then wave A, wave B, and wave C. And the reason, the reason why I'm actually looking for this to be wave 4 and why I don't think that top has already been put in place here for dollar index is because the substructure, okay, from this 9170 to a new high was in three waves. And if you are familiar with the Elliott waves, then you know that three wave moves are part of our corrections or are part of a complex correction. In our case, I think it's part of a complex correction. And that's why I don't trust this move uh, very to the downside yes, yet. And okay. I think it represents larger posts with still ongoing uptrend. Thank so you, Greg. I have a I have an interview. You may even want to stick around to hear Jim. I I followed Jim's work for the last I don't know two decades, maybe longer. Um, he's very good with fundamentals. I'm just going to take a quick break and then make Jim the Welsh the presenter. And uh, looking forward to his interview. Thank you for dropping in and giving us some clarity, Grega.
Stand by everyone for Jim Welsh. We'll get this started in about two minutes. I'm just going to take a quick break. Stand by for Jim Welsh. And uh, you guys can also get his newsletter. You can get his newsletter. Uh, at the end, we'll get some information. One of the best technical letters I've read uh, in my career. And we're going to be covering all the ATSA classes that everyone's interested in here. Stand by, Jim. Stand by, Face. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, when I say a minute, I mean a minute. So, Jim, I'm going to make you the presenter now, buddy. And you can screen share. You want to show any charts? You are now the presenter. I look forward to hearing your voice. How's that? Now it says I am unmuted. All right, buddy. <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Are you are you uh, you on the road and you called in to do this? Uh, well, I, again, as a novice here, uh, I just am so used to doing interviews on the phone uh, right. always. So I just okay. dialed in. Okay. And, uh, um, well, I you're tried to reach coming, you early, but you were already on on the road, so to speak. Okay. So. Well, you're you're coming in loud and clear. Thanks so much for <laughs> taking the time out of your day. Full disclosure: I've known Jim. I don't know what 25 years now, Jim. Uh, I'm afraid it is that long, Dale. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, we go back to when we were both on the Financial F News N Network. N yeah. Yeah. 1990. And, you know, Anyone in here remember the FNN before CNBC? They were located in LA. So we were on similar channels, and I uh, reached out to meet Jim, and we had a beer at the Sandbar in Carlsbad. And <laughs> that's been the beginning of a decades long friendship. And we used to call each other every day to talk about markets. And it's great to have you here, Jim. You know, I still read your newsletter, your technical updates all the time. Are you still calling it Macro Tides? Yep, still calling it Macro Tides uh, and the weekly uh, technical review, uh, which primarily, uh, as the name implies, uh, right. looks at various markets uh, via charts, momentum indicators, and so forth. Sentiment obviously being a, a big part of the game, as well as positioning in various futures markets. Uh, Right. which I have found to be, you know, a big, big help when you get a combination of sentiment getting lopsided, either, uh, you know, and I would use this analogy, if you think about it, you got 10 people in a room, if seven of them are bullish or seven of them are bearish, uh, you know, you have a, a, you know, a lopsided relationship, and that's when opportunities really show up. Uh, and then, in terms of the futures market, looking, looking at the positioning, and seeing where the com commercials are, where the large specs are. And if you can line up sentiment where you have too many people bearish or bullish and you look at the commercials and you see that they're taking the opposite position of where the sentiment is. And then lastly, uh, as I'm sure you guys do on a regular basis, go through and um, uh, you know align the technicals to pinpoint when a turn is taking place. To me, that's that's the logic of what I try to do. And then lastly, uh, on a monthly basis, uh, macro tides is a fundamental piece looking at what's happening uh, in the U.S. economy, but also looking at what's going on around the world because we are in a global economy and things that happen overseas, this is not like Vegas. You know, things that happen overseas don't stay overseas anymore. Uh, they get transmitted uh, very quickly, you know, to the U.S. So, you know, to me, it's very important to stay on top of all that stuff and try to integrate it into uh, the technical landscape. And when the two uh, come together, uh, where the fundamentals are either positive or deteriorating and the technicals are doing the same thing, to me, that's when I have a higher conviction call in terms of what I expect markets to do. You know, that philosophy really lines up with Blake Morrow's. Uh, he's one of the partners in Forex Analytics and he says that too, Jim. If you're just looking at the charts, you're missing half the picture. And that, yeah. uh, the, the fundamentals are important, Ed, which is kind of a, a nice segue. Uh, I believe you wrote a piece 
recently about China. Yeah. Am I correct? I, re I received yeah. it, and yep. uh, it's uh, what I got out of it is that although most people are pretty sanguine about what's going on there, uh, you have uh, uh, a different view, and you think that, like you said, the transmission mechanism uh, that happens everywhere in the world affects every place in the world. So uh, what is it that has you concerned about China and is it your number one pick for some type of black swan event later in the year or next year? Yeah, uh, it was in the May commentary uh, and I've kind of been watching China for really the last number of years just because of what's happening uh, to the way they're generating growth, Dale. And I may not uh, have prepared you well, but you know, uh, you can screen share and show charts. Maybe you're not prepared to do it today and we could do this audio, but you would have been able to show your letter and et cetera on a screen share. I don't know if you want to try it. Okay, yeah, there you me, go. Yeah, let me see here. I can pull up something here. Okay, okay there you go. Yeah, let me minimize this. Pull this over here. Pull up. Yeah, and you know how you know my technical prowess, so you're doing a lot better than me. <laughs> so, you know uh, what these these guys brought me <laughs> into this new room, go to meeting, and yes. we did a re we did a re rehearsal, and yes. I was I was throwing up my hands. I said, Oh, I'll never <laughs> I'll never be able to get this room, and you know sometimes I still struggle in. And my wife Ann said, Dale, you always freak out every time there's some a new learning curve for you. Don't worry, you'll get it. Yeah. But, okay. It, you know, we're uh, old bar dogs and we know how to bark so we can yeah, learn how to trick you know, too, I mean, right? I've been dragged kicking and screaming <laughs> into the twenty first century for <laughs> years already. So All right. So for those who are looking, this is the Macrotides monthly uh, letter which went out a couple weeks ago. And the first chart you can see down draft, this is showing GDP for China clearly there was a peak in 2011 and it's been subsiding ever since uh, the key point in terms of China is that most of the growth that they've been generating over the last five years has been through uh, yeah. excessive debt and so for every dollar of GDP or pardon me every increase of one dollar in debt you know maybe 10 15 years ago they would get 90 cents of GDP now, for every one dollar increase in debt, they're getting about ten to twenty cents worth of GDP. And so, you know, the flat line that you see in G GDP in that chart um, is kind of masking what's going on under the surface. One of the things I found really very interesting, and to me, this is why I think China, sometime over the next six to nine months, could become problematic. This is a chart of excess li liquidity. And it's kind of simple. You take money supply growth, and then you subtract inflation, and you subtract GDP growth. And what's left over is excess liquidity, A, because it's not being used in the economy. They then, the guys who put this together, shifted it six months forward, since there's normally a lag time between changes in monetary policy and its impact on economic growth or slowing. Uh, the six-month uh, shift is kind of interesting, and you can see the correlation with um, property prices and housing prices is unbelievably tight. What's interesting is the red line, which is the excess liquidity, has rolled over and started to turn down. And what that implies is GDP growth in the first quarter was 6.9%, but 20% of that came from an increase in housing prices. So what that tells us is that in the coming months, housing is likely to slow, and as housing prices come down, GDP is going to be under pressure. Uh, all we can see is since August of 2016, the uh, People's Bank of China has I been remember raising. that day. That was the day the Dow opened 1,000 points lower and recovered, right? Yeah, exactly. So okay. you know, what they did, in effect, was a twofold. They, they uh, lowered their currency by about 4% in value, um, but then they started to raise interest rates because one of the things that began to happen as Chinese people perceived that the central bank was going to continue to lower the value of the yuan, people they wanted to start two cases full of money out of yep. the country. Yep. Exactly, and so their okay. foreign reserves went from four trillion in mid 2014, 
and continued to drop pretty precipitously. By the end of 2016, 18 months later, they were down to about three uh, trillion. So in order to keep money there, they enacted a bunch of rules and regulation limits in terms of how much money you can take out annually, I think is $50,000, um, limiting companies being able to buy companies outside of China. Why? Because that would also be another way to get money out. But what you can so see they, is they, these are pretty draconian um, capital controls, aren't they? Yeah, on the verge of capital controls, not okay. complete 100%, but you're right, Dale, in that you know they're they're setting up uh, fences to keep money in and mm -hmm. then they decided to raise interest rates in order to if you will reward some of that money uh right. staying in and also to remove the incentive by providing higher short-term rates uh, to keep money in uh, china um and the net result is, is worked since the beginning of this year foreign reserves have stopped declining I think a month ago they went up you know, by a very token amount, but yet they went up. Uh, here we can see the impact on the China's government bond yield, which has gone from you know two just two ten something like that to uh, over three percent to about three thirty five ish. Um, a and, doubling, seventy yes, percent higher. Yeah, very very significant. And China uh, is the third largest bond market on the planet, and you can see the impact on the five-year corporate bond yields have risen really significantly. And why this is doubly important, uh, Dale, is that the big increase in debt that's gone on in China, they've gone from, I don't know, 130% to 270% debt to GDP ratio uh, right. since 2008. Uh, uh, is the biggest growth area has been uh, corporations. And so one of the shell games going on in China is they have you know all the infrastructure uh, companies that are state owned over there steel aluminum uh, glass uh, and so forth they're operating at 65 to 70 percent of capacity and so they've been losing money but the state owned banks continue to loan them money and so when it comes to a point where they can't make a payment guess what they just redo the loan <laughs> and reloan the money so that's one of the reasons why debt has been increasing uh, in China without a commensurate increase in GDP growth. They're just rolling over and increasing debt to companies that are they're giving them a lifeline more than well, anything. Uh, so, uh, what, what would be the end game there that, uh, what would stop them from doing that ad, ad infinitum? Um, I, I really don't know that they will stop. Um, okay. you, you know, you get to a point where you head down a certain path and you're so far, you know, there's an old, old movie, John Wayne movie uh, called, uh, and it just blew my mind, uh, The High and the Mighty, okay? It's from the 1950s. Okay. It was the first actual airplane movie, and the whole story is John Wayne, Robert Stack, they're flying from Honolulu to San Francisco. They start to have some engine trouble, but then they get past the point of no return because they're more than halfway there. They right. don't have fuel, then they go back. And to me, that's what's happening here is China has been going down this pathway of stepping on the brake, stepping on the gas, back and forth. And that's what we've seen with their monetary policy the last four or five years is they're trying to break this, this steamroller. And as soon as things start to get a little edgy, then they you know back off because they're politicians, <laughs> no different than the politicians in this country. And in order to you know stay in power and stay in office, they've got to maintain at least the illusion of good growth, so that people coming off the farms and you know the rural areas and going to the cities actually can maybe find a job. Um, but you know, I think at some point in time, to your point, Dale, it's kind of like 2008. Did the Fed or any of the central banks expect to have a financial crisis on their hands? And the answer, of course, is no. And so, you know, if things go as they normally do in the, you know, affairs of men, is at some point in time, this thing will kind of get out of control on its own, uh, one way or the other. And there will be a, a, you know, a crisis of some magnitude in China. And, you know, that's important because China continues to provide um, uh, an, an inordinate amount to the total increase in global GDP growth. 
all right? So they are the engine that continues to drive the global economy. Uh, one of the games they've been playing is with these negotiable certificates of deposit. And you can see that chart shows the increase in assets. They, they allowed them in 19 or two. Yeah, it's, it's just parabolic, exactly. From 2013, they've gone from under 100 billion to like two and a, two, uh, I think 1.6 trillion dollars. So what's happening is small and mid-sized banks are taking money in from investors, giving them, uh, you know, a CD effectively, but then they're turning around and buying government and corporate bonds. Well, in the chart above uh, that we just showed, we can see how well that's been working as they were buying corporate bonds and playing the spread between what they were offering on the negotiable certificates of deposit and getting a higher rate on the corporate bonds, all of a sudden they just get their head handed to them. So short-term rates have gone up maybe 90 basis points on the overnight rate, and we can yeah. see that the increase in the corporate bond has gone up far more significantly, which implies that these guys bought them and then they puked them. And that's in part why corporate bond yields have gone up higher. Um, this is a chart of the Shanghai, and as you can see from the lows of January of last year, in the yeah. last month, the Shanghai has broken below that rising trend line. Yeah, you, you wouldn't call that move impulsive, would you? Uh, you know, no, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> it's I mean, very overlapping, yes. Yeah, and, and really just uh, worked off its oversold condition in time rather yep. than price. Yeah, so, not, uh, a, not a significant rally. So we have a rally. breakdown that the whole world's ignoring on the Shanghai. Yes, I think so. Now, it got pretty oversold, uh, and it's been rebounding. Uh, I think entered overnight one night uh, a week or so ago. It got down to 31.58. A 50% retracement would get you back up to about 3,300, which that's just about where that trend line comes. So as I know you have, I'm sure, discussed many, many times, very often things will break a trend line, uh, right. whether it's above or below, and then only come back to what I call to the scene of the crime. And so yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, for me, looking at the Shanghai, waiting to see if it can get back up towards, uh, it's gotten up to about 32.60. I think it was 32.30 last night-ish. Um, so that is one of the things that I'm looking at, to wait for that rebound to end. And then more importantly, if it starts to roll over and take out the recent lows, that would be one of, to me, the warning signs uh, I've got a few charts here, the, the China PMI, barely over 50. And the other tell that took place that a lot of people, I think, have been ignoring is if you look at iron ore prices, they're down yeah. really very significantly. Things like rubber prices down significantly. So China is a huge consumer of all this stuff. And if their economy really was growing at 6.9 and improving and all the rest, this likely would not be happening. These charts would not look this way. And then uh, looking at copper, uh, and you know, just looking at it from that high in 2011, and um, what makes that high significant is because if, going back to the, the second chart we looked at, which was excess reserves, the excess reserves number peaked right before, about six months before the peak in copper and a lot of commodities uh, in 2011. So this idea that you know, liquidity is starting to turn negative in China and it's right. starting to you know have an impact uh, you know this certainly was the case in 2011 you can see that this move in copper from over 450 to the low of two bucks at the end of uh, 2015 it's a you know so far totally a three wave rally up and yeah. that opens the door you know that could be just three way up for a of four and then we're going to get a retracement maybe down to two and a quarter and then another, you know, push up towards three bucks for a C of four. But just looking at it, to me, getting below 245, um, there's, you know, nothing but air until about 225. So to me, this is another one of those tells that I want to be monitoring because if copper starts to really break down, um, I, I'm not sure that the, the, the you know, that everyone is going to be able to, to ignore it. And so... So your no, target on five is pretty close to the end of uh, the financial crisis. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, as you, you know, all it has to do is take out the low of way three, and you've completed the five down. Okay. Yeah. Um, so whether it gets down to you know a buck uh, eighty-five or a dollar forty-five, I have no idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I do believe though that this 
if it did in fact start to you know press the lows that people would start to question the synchronized global economy which seems to be one of the buzz phrase that you know over the last month or so or actually a few months people have been right. talking about and this obviously flies in the face of that the other thing um, you know the first quarter GDP in the US was up 07 percent you know you probably have heard stuff about the seasonality well this shows the last I think six or eight years the first quarter has been just under one percent the other three quarters have averaged around two and a half right. so there is definitely an issue with the seasonals but one thing Dale that I haven't heard anybody talk about that I really believe is significant is that everyone got very optimistic obviously the financial markets did in terms of Trump gets elected pro-growth policies tax cuts reductions in regulation and so forth uh, isn't life going to be wonderful so we see a big increase in small business confidence consumer confidence and then the reality is everyone is waiting for it's kind of like somebody says okay I'm going to set you up uh, on a, a date and you get a look at the picture and it's a current picture not one from 25 years ago um, and she's really a good-looking woman or a good handsome man gotta make sure in this day and age you cover both bases here and um, uh, so you know you're looking forward to it looking wow okay can't wait and then on Wednesday you get a phone call up ah, work she's been called out of town and she's gonna be gone for three weeks or he's gonna be gone for three weeks and it's like okay you're still looking forward to it you're willing to overlook that you know I got three weeks of time to go by and to me that's what investors have been doing in the sense that they're looking forward to those tax cuts so strongly that oh the first quarter of GDP we're gonna forget about that we're not even gonna pay attention um, and estimates for the second quarter of three and a half to four percent are flying out there yes there's gonna be a rebound in the second quarter but the point to me, Dale, is that if you look at bank lending, and oh, let's scroll down, still, and uh, it really has, okay, so the spread yeah. chart on the top, and you can see for about a period of two years, bank lending hovered between seven and a half to eight and a quarter percent, um, you know, like a rock, and yeah. it's fallen out of bed since just after the election. So when I see this and you say, okay, what could cause such a significant drop in lending uh, yeah, and then you look at what's going on in the economy it's like no there's nothing wrong with the economy that would cause people to pull back so abruptly and I think the reality is that a lot of companies have just stepped back they're not spending money until they get the details of the tax cuts find out if there's going to be special incentives for various business investments and so forth and I think consumers have done much the same thing um, and, and so as all this political noise comes out of Washington not only is it a distraction but it really is pushing back further and further until we get to the point where we will know the details and at that point in time I think businesses will move forward so my point is that people uh, for uh, you know economists and so forth are looking for three and a half four percent GDP in the second quarter and they may not get it because of this. They may not get it because people are going to continue to wait until they really see what's going on. And in the meantime, things like auto sales have been very weak. They've been doing right. huge incentives, um, yeah. but yet the auto companies haven't cut uh, production, even though inventories are quite high. So to me, there's the potential of a uh, pullback in uh, in markets and so forth and let me see if I can do one other thing here well you know speaking uh, about week and I know you cover it Jim um, okay you want to go here first that that's fine uh, I was gonna yeah. say speaking about week let's talk about the dollar but uh, yeah I'm interested in your TLT look and okay I don't we'll, know, we'll I don't the know dollar you know, yeah I yeah. don't know if you noticed it but I was talking to Blake about it that uh, specs in um, the bonds, COT, yeah. have gone from a record net short position to a record net long position in a record yeah. amount of, of shortness time. of time. Right, right. And that's something that in the weekly technical as well as I think in one of my monthly letters, I really focused on. And it gave me the conviction. Uh, Abe, going into the first quarter, I thought GDP was going to slow for a lot of different reasons. 
and that, yes, the Fed would raise rates, but when I looked at the positioning, starting in December and going forward, you're right, large specs, hedge funds, and everybody bought the story of Trump gets elected, GDP is going to really grow, uh, the Fed's going to raise rates, uh, J.P. Morgan was out there with five increases and so forth, yeah. and and it's kind of like everyone positioned for you know the event, and then what we saw in in mid March was the thirty year and the ten year basically tested their December highs, so you had kind of like the potential for a double top, and then on the day of the Fed actually did raise rates, bond no, yields were down five to ten basis points uh, at yeah. that point in time. So I had actually recommended going long TLT around 117, got out above 123, because I felt that as we got to this spike here in, uh, I think it was April 18th, yeah, so that the positioning that once the 10-year got under 230, because from a chart-wise, yeah. you know, it bounced between 230 to 60. Yeah, that that's when the intensity on uh, the shorts would really, really pick up. They'd be forced to cover, and to your point, uh, in co cover they did because it, it is one of the more amazing uh, swings in terms of uh, going from record short to you know, I think they're not quite near record long, but the, the swing has been enormous. And um, but. The ir irony here is that the pattern in the Treasury uh, bonds and, and TLT has the potential of being an A up from last March, B on this recent sell-off, and that we may get a C-wave rally. And I had originally said targets like 126 to 129, depending on the retracement. If we the, the TLT the left a gap on Election Day. Yeah, you, here you can see it right here. Right. Uh, you know, from the high back in July of last summer, uh, 143 and change down to 116, you know, yeah. that's uh, 27 points, 13 points, 50 percent retracement, 129. So that's how I got that number. I see. And, okay. and then you can see this trend line, which goes back, obviously, where so there's the potential that the bonds could have another significant rally. And to me. A, I don't think the economy is going to be so slow as to warrant that kind of a move in bond yields to come down, especially, in fact, as you just noted, uh, you know, the shorts have been pretty much uh, covered. So we don't have that fuel to drive the bond market. So Good to point. me, the only way the bonds get to 126 to 129 is an event. And last week, uh, Wednesday, when we had the crash in the stock market, right. <laughs> it was down 1.8%, uh, you know, the 10-year dropped 10 basis points. So to me, there's the potential that this idea of a little bit of a growth scare uh, or something out of China, something that causes a disruption, scares people, that the market then has another leg to the downside, and yeah. bonds have another run up. How about Comey's testimony on June 8th? You know, that certainly could be uh, part of the equation, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. there's so many things floating out there that this is where, you know, looking at the fundamental side, looking at the technical side, you know, the technicals are hinting at something, another move up in bond prices so drop and yield. So say we get there. Yeah, say we get there, Jim, up towards 129, 130, and you counted this in a five-wave sequence to the downside, and this would be an yeah. ABC up towards that. Yeah. That would be the end of a wave two with a three or C to come to the downside, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. And so, I mean, this could be, you know, if you missed the bear market in bonds uh, last year, um, yes. you know, threes or Cs, are at this least would be quality. a better opportunity. And you know my favorite FIB extension, don't you? <laughs> One point, one, <laughs> one uh, point six one eight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that could be uh, that could be a money wave. So, uh, with this going on, uh, a lot of people saying dollars breaking down. A lot of people saying it's just a pause. Some Elliotticians gave the euro a chance to get back to one eighteen or so before the next big dollar rally. I'm curious what you're thinking here in the Dixie. Okay. Uh, I'm getting there. Uh, okay. Let's see here. 
and and as far as the stock market, so if we get uh, that rally in the bonds to 130 and a pullback in the stock market, I think your longer term view in S and P's was you were looking for a high in the spring, right? Which so far we got, and then maybe a seven percent pullback. Uh, probably closer to five percent. I thought twenty three eleven. There's a really small gap at uh, on the S and P okay. at twenty three eleven. Okay. Uh, that we would and get then new high, and then new highs and then yes. that might be the end of the bull market. That is correct. Okay. okay. So here's a dollar chart and um, I thought the dollar in January you know was set up. The sentiment was very uh, bullish at that point. We had just made a, a, a new high above the prior high in March of 2015. Uh, the positioning in the futures market, you know there were just too many people that were long. So I expected that there would be a pullback. Uh, and so when we got down to the nine, under 99 here in, in March, I thought, okay, this is a shot for, you know, ABC, we'll go up and make a new high. That obviously proved wrong. And the count that looks possible to me at this point in time is that you had an ABC down to the March low for wave A, then yeah. An, an X wave up to 101.34, and if we have a quality, it gets you to, I think, 96.38. I'm trying to th think of what I wrote it yesterday afternoon. I can't remember okay. it. Okay, so uh, so that would complete uh, you know what would be called a double zigzag, and that would set up for at least, uh, I, I, new highs are probably unlikely, but at least a fairly decent rally. Uh, as you can see the nine ish, yeah, maybe maybe par. You know, uh -huh. uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, you know how dynamic. You know, first it has to break that the trend line that it, you know, that it just broke below. But you can see the RSI is under twenty eight. Uh, for the first time in three years, large specs uh, are long the euro. Uh, right. Bullish sentiment is up to about seventy five percent the euro. Yeah. So. Right. You know, at the beginning of our call, I said, you know, when you get to like seven out of ten, uh, yeah. that's the time to start looking to go the other way. And right. I think we're there, but um, this has been a little bit of a freight train. So to me, I think you need to be patient before you go running out to to go short uh, the euro. Uh, right. Plus, there's a reason to think that the dollar index, you know, has another fifty, sixty cents to go on the downside, given how oversold. You know, the first bounce would probably be a bounce and then a pull back. You know, so I mean, I think right. there's some time here. It's got to set but, up some non confirmations. Uh, that's yes. a pretty low RSI reading down there. Yes, yeah. yeah. And if it gets down to 96.38 or whatever, the RSI will, you know, be obviously most likely even lower. So that shows a fair amount of intense selling pressure. But again, that selling pressure is liquidation of longs, people, you know, changing their outlook. So I going see. back to the bonds. To me, the two things that could hurt bonds, let's say we have some kind of an event and bonds rally, whether it's to 126 or 129 on TLT, um, uh, that at some point in time, the prospects of you know the tax cuts and stuff will get renewed and look like it's going to be more realistic. That's one of the triggers. The other trigger is the ECB, I think before the end of this year, is going to back away from their quantitative easy program uh, right. at a minimum scaling it down from the 60 billion a month to something less than that uh, and I think the key is looking at the 10-year boons and if they close above 50 basis points I think they had a couple high in the high 40s uh, in the last few months that that technically all of a sudden looks like they they sprint to you know 90 to 100 basis points and if the boon makes that kind of a move, it's hard to believe that uh, the treasuries aren't going to get pulled up with it. So in a perfect world, you know, we'll get the rally in bonds, prices, yields will come down again. And then sometime before the end of the year, uh, we'll start to see bonds start to weaken. Then something will happen with the ECB. Uh, the U.S. economy may get the lift from the, you know, uh, the fiscal stimulus program. And, uh, you know, then bonds would be vulnerable to the beginning of a sizable decline. But okay. I, I will say one thing, Dale, is that um, I think one will have to be patient. 
In other words, we saw that sprint from 130 to 260. Even though we're going into a third wave, um, you know, so many people are yield star, pension funds, you right. know, retirees and so forth. So that as yields tick up, you know, when they get to 260 on the 10 year next time, you know, there's still going to be some people who buy. Uh, more yeah. people will step to in at 3%, which was the high at the end of 2013. So my right. point is, initially, people are going to look in the bond market at these upticks in yields as, you know, buying opportunities. Right. And it, only when we get into the third of the third that, right. uh, you know, the, the light bulb goes on and it's like, okay, everyone, every man for himself. Um, and that just may take a year or so. Um, because longer term, I believe that there's a, uh, when push comes to shove, you know, we're talking about the Chinese, you know, where they abandon their policy, you know, levers. I don't think so. I think the same thing applies to every central bank. And so I think at some point in time, if we go into recession and all of a sudden we're not looking at, you know, a trillion dollar deficit, we're looking at something north of that. I think there's the real potential that the Federal Reserve will buy Treasury bonds directly from the Treasury. And they'll expand their balance sheet very significantly. Forget about tapering it from four and a half trillion to two. If push comes to shove, they will buy the paper. And will they buy of, stocks if we ever get a bear market? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that they will step in from time to time and buy futures to stabilize things uh our futures well, market offer that you know more well, leverage will, uh, the fed Japan. hike rates next month jim um you know I, I think the problem will be dale that when the underlying fundamentals deteriorate and people realize that the fed and other central banks have far less ammunition uh, than what they did in 2007 i mean remember yeah. fed funds was five and a quarter percent isn't that really the reason behind them uh, normalizing anyway, so they have ammunition in case what you talk about happens? Yes, uh, but the, the headwind that they're facing is in 1982, there was a dollar sixty of debt for every one dollar of GDP in the U.S. We're pushing three fifty to three seventy, and we're actually the best house on the block. Europe is like four sixty. Japan is over six dollars of debt, and so every incremental increase in yields really has an inordinate impact on economic growth. And the impact on the budget deficit will be very significant. For every 1% increase in bond yields, it'll add 150 to $200 billion a year in annual expense, interest expense. So this is one of the reasons why I think the Fed may actually take that extreme step of buying paper directly Last year, the Fed <clears throat> remitted back to the Treasury almost $100 billion of interest that they earned on Treasury paper that they owned. Mm -hmm. So if we think about it, if you go back and look at the budget in 2007, the Treasury paid about $230 billion uh, in interest expense. Mm -hmm. Last year, it was 250 So wait a second. Public debt just about doubled. Yes, rates came down significantly. Uh, which is the main reason why interest expense didn't go through the roof. But, you know, from that 250, subtract about $98 billion from the Fed. So right. one of the dangers, you know, going forward is that interest expense starts to eat alive everything else. Right. One way right. to avoid that is just have the Fed buy the paper and um, remit back okay. then the, the, the interest to the Treasury. How about when, when to buy gold, Jim? I know you cover gold, and we'll wrap it with that. And, yep. then, and then how people can subscribe or get a free trial to yep. uh, okay. guides. Yep. So I've been looking for gold to drop to 1200. It's been trading better than I expected. When I look at the futures market, uh, a few months ago, there were more shorts in the silver market with silver at 18 to 1850 than yeah. last summer when it was over 20. <clears throat> yeah. Those, those shorts have come down significantly. Uh, the large specs were really long. Those are so the the positioning in the futures market is kind of neutral at this point in time. So I so the chart. Uh, yeah, and so to me, uh, you know, big picture, I have been expecting after this pullback, there will be a move above the highs from last July. I've been targeting fourteen fifty or so. 
Why? Uh, to 1480 because that's the 50 percent retracement from 1920 right. down to 1040. Got it. Uh, you know, and yeah. uh, GDX, I think, which is the gold stock index, can get above 31 and maybe make a, a run to 37. So it's just a question of finding that right entry point. My expectation was that we were going to see more weakness. And if we do, if gold does, in fact, get down to 1,200, then to me that would be a great buying opportunity because I'm assuming the positioning would be far more constructive at that price level. Good In terms of <clears throat> getting information, Jim Welsh, W-E-L-S-H, macro, at gmail.com. So you send me an email, reference uh, this uh, interview with Dale, and uh, I will say this, Dale, you know, was a journalism major, so I'm sure you guys have garnered that from time to time in terms of how he expresses himself, but he's a fine technician and he does really understand the bigger picture, I think, really well. So it doesn't surprise me that he has a, a room full of people that are eager to listen to him um, because he is a, a really knowledgeable guy and he, I think, knows how to cut to the chase. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, focusing on the key points is probably more important than anything else because there's so much noise, so much information available these days it's easy to get swamped, and I'm sure Dale does a great job of keeping you guys uh, focused and providing good information. So, And by bringing in a guy like you, great interview, Jim. Uh, wish Heidi a happy birthday Saturday. Uh, and, and same to you on Saturday, okay. <laughs> big boy. Uh, Dale and my wife are born on the exact same day. What are the in odds the, of that? We looked and we first city. met that. No, you're a Skokie. Oh. She's Milwaukee. But uh, within 90 miles, I mean, yeah. that ought to count for something. But the main thing right, is that so the same day. I encourage people, I encourage people to uh, take Jim up on his offer for his newsletter. You also work for an RIA if people have retirement money or anything. Uh, you have an outlet for them to, yep. to do that too, right? Absolutely. And I have a sector rotation model with a tactical overlay that goes short during bear markets. And during bull phases, looks at uh, the top 15 sectors of the S&P, small cap and mid cap. And the idea being is, hey, we don't want to be in the, the dogs. We want to be just in the top four or five sectors. So it's a way to try to avoid, uh, you know, bombshells like what happened with energy stocks a year ago and so forth. So thank you so right, much. Buddy. And I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, i sorry this probably ran a little longer, but this was the yeah, first time Dale and great. I had the opportunity to do this. So it, thank you so, so much. Uh, so uh, uh, much success the rest of the year, my trading warrior yep. brother, Jim. Thanks so much <laughs> for taking time out to hang out with me today. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, All buddy. Right. Everyone, Bye -bye. Uh, thank Jim Welsh. Uh, I encourage you guys. Thank you very much. Oh, Jim, someone brought up Buzz Schwartz. So I don't know if you're still here, but <laughs> I'm here. That's a, that's a blast from the past, huh? So they remember you from Buzz Schwartz. So. <laughs> Money Radio. Hey, Money Radio. Long time ago. Like All right. All right, uh, buddy. All righty. Take care. Thanks, Dale. All right, All right man. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jim. Bye. All right, Face. I'm glad you guys enjoyed Jim. Yeah, he look he's great, isn't he? Yeah, get his letter. I'll see everyone tomorrow. So my mission every day in Forex Analytics mission every day is to build up and edify traders every day and hope that was accomplished today and we're adding value to what you want to accomplish as a trader. Adios. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings, and see everyone tomorrow. Good hunting in the meantime.